morning. Oh, not quite. There we go. Now, good morning. I'm thankful to be back here. Thankful to be able to study with you this morning. The lessons are kind of broke up in, in weird spots. You've got the end of lesson nine had like two questions about Matthew six, and then lesson ten had four or five, and then it tries to go through seven. To me, it made sense just to take kind of three weeks and go Matthew 5, Matthew 6, Matthew 7 in order. So we're in Matthew 6 this morning. I want to look primarily at the text. Um, the questions aren't great. We'll kind of get those as we go through. So I've kind of added a few more to that. Um, but we're going to get started in our study. Uh, let's offer a word of prayer. And then after that, we'll ask some, have some volunteers to read like we've done before. And then we'll kind of dive in and see what's there. All right, let's pray together. Our kind and our gracious Father, thank you for this beautiful morning that we're having. Thank you for the health and the strength to be able to wake up this morning, to be able to prepare ourselves and our families to be here. Thank you for this opportunity. Father, we're mindful of those who are sick and unable to do that, Father. Our blessing of health comes from you, and we thank you for what we've been given, and we are mindful of those who struggle against their health. Help us to be good servants to those people, to know how we can help, and then to extend our hands and our time and our concern to them and, and bring them along as, as others have done for us. Lord God, thank you for the opportunity to worship and to study about you. You revealing yourself is a sign of your character and your love for us. Help us to take advantage of that and to learn of you and to learn in our text this morning of Jesus and the way he taught in his kingdom and see how Jesus distinguished his kingdom from that what, that what the Jews were doing and what the Gentiles were doing. Lord God, we beg you to forgive us of our sins. You are holy and we turn aside from your commandments and we lay aside the example of Jesus from time to time. Please forgive us of those things and help us to turn from them, to learn from those mistakes and to teach others more about what your word says. Lord God, thank you for this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <coughs> All right. Uh, let's take sort of three, four verses at a time. Uh, if I could find the one I clicked. There we go. Um, if we get one through four for a reader, and then we'll pick up maybe four or five verses, just kind of breaking it up after that. Uh, volunteer for Matthew 6, uh, one to four. Speak now or get voluntold. All right, uh, Sean, you'll have one through four. And then if we could have someone ready for, uh, let me get over here, five through um, eight Okay, after that. All right, and Julie will have that. And if you want to pick up the next four after that, that would work. Okay, go ahead. And um, if you don't mind, tell us what version you're reading from, just in case. Okay. <laughs> Um, five through eight. And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the street, that they may be seen by men. But surely I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place. And your father, who sees you in secret, will reward you openly. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them, for your father knows the things you have need of before you ask him. Okay. Um, can you go 9 to, like, 15? Yeah. All right. Perfect. You can gain. All right. In this manner, therefore, pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Forgive you. But if you do not forgive men 
their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Okay, and then one more for the last three, 16, 17, 18. All right, Bob. Uh, English Standard Version. And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Okay. And we'll stop there because the teaching kind of takes a turn in, into another subject. Um, did you notice any patterns, any repetition, any structure to what we've read so far? Anything you notice? Yes, sir. It's all contrast. You see this, but I say do this. Mm -hmm. you know, every, everything he's teaching here is, a, if you will, take what you've seen and forget it. <laughs> this is not the correct way to God wants you to do it. Right? Don't do this. Exactly. The, the pattern of contrast actually continues from chapter 5. The difference here is chapter 5 had its contrast in, you've heard that it was said, fill in the blank, but I say to you, right, part B. This is a contrast not in that way, but it's here's what you've seen people do, and instead do, do another thing. So still that, that pattern of contrast, okay? Um, someone else, what else do you notice throughout this? What, what's being talked about? Yeah. The idea of why are you doing things? Okay. Are you doing things so that people will see them, or are you doing things for the right reason? Okay. So instead of just, you've heard what has been taught, and now I'm going to teach you differently, or teach you more correctly what you ought to be doing. This is, here's the reason sort of why people do the things that they do. And on the other hand, you need a, a better reason. So we're kind of almost going down a layer, right? Not just, not to say that obedience is surface, but now we've got reason that underlies that. Uh, Tony, did you have something? Oh, okay. And, which is basically not pleasing man or being pleasing to man is pleasing God. Okay, so now we get down to, okay, who is, what's motivating these people? Um, three times, it has something to do with being done before other people. Right, for the, for the benefit or side of people. Yes, ma'am. Right. So, and that's a bit new, isn't it? I mean, we didn't really have much by way of reward so far in, in chapter 5. It's just, you know, old teaching and new teaching, but nothing really about the end result. But 6 adds that in. Right? You have the end result of what the hypocrites do versus the end result of what those who follow God do. Right? Yes? Building off what Dennis said, it, it, it seems to me a big chunk of it is a heart issue. It's how your heart is, where Absolutely. your heart is, where your mind is. Why, I mean, you already said, why, why we are doing things, what we expect the result to be when we do something. Yeah, absolutely. This comes back to motivation. This comes back to the heart. Why are you doing what you're doing? Yes, sir. Uh, the first two words in my book were in chapter 6 of take heed. So it's a call to action. It's something that has to be intentional. You train yourself to have the habit of thinking this way or thinking that way. Yes. Something we have to do with it. So not just a here's what, but a call, like you said, to pay attention, to take heed. Um, I think the ESV has beware, which is that same idea of, hey, look out there's something here you need to notice, right? Don't overlook this, which I, I like that because it's not just what we're doing, but you need to pay attention to what you're doing and why you're doing that thing. Yeah. I think it's, uh, this, this can be easy to do because I think anyone who has ever, anyone who has ever stood up there, you want to do it well. Mm -hmm. And it's nice when people tell you that you did a good job on whatever you did, but that can't be our motivation. And that can be hard sometimes. Absolutely. I think that, that definitely can be a, a difficult thing to do. Um, quick, I, I don't go too heavily into the words in this Sunday morning study because it's, it's a bit more of a survey. But uh, hypocrites. Has anybody ever heard the root meaning or source for that word? It's a Greek word. actually very similar to that. But where does it come from? Actors. Yes. It comes from like stage actors where they would put on different faces or they would play roles to convince the audience that they were you know, whoever they said to be. These people who are practicing their righteousness to be seen by others, it's like it's as if they're on a stage. 
And Jesus uses the word for a stage actor to describe these people and what they're doing, right? Um, I like verse 1 because in verse 1, kind of like, like Sean pointed out, this is sort of the, the overall lookout for this thing. And then you get examples of it, right? Beware practicing your righteousness before others. And then Jesus gives three examples of righteousness or doing the right thing. Um, what are those three that he gives here in, the, in this text? He says, beware basically of doing the right thing for the wrong reason, okay, to be seen by others. What's the three that he gave us? The first was what? Giving, giving okay, or, or uh, you know, being generous, giving alms, taking care of benevolence, we might call that, right? Be care that that's not done for the sight of other people, okay? Uh, someone else, number two. Praying, all right? So prayers for the benefit of seeing others. Okay, third? Fasting. And fasting, all right? Um, I, I like that prayer and fasting are sort of side by side here. It's typically in Scripture they go together. One fasts to try to, you know, clear their mind to get closer to God, and usually prayer goes right along with that. And normally you see prayer and fasting almost in the same sentence usually in the same sentence, right? So those are your three. There is a break in the pattern of the text, though. Did you catch that? We have, uh, thus, when you give to the needy, right, uh, verse 5, and when you pray, verse 7, and when you pray. But then in verse 9, what happens? <coughs> yeah. He's, he's teaching a format to pray, an example of a prayer. Yeah. So he's, he's, he's teaching yeah. Literally, showing them this is how you should do it. Yeah, there's, I, I call it an, an aside. This is kind of in the process of teaching about this, doing things for the right reasons. When he gets to prayer, it's almost as if this subject is so important, he says, okay, we're going to stop what we're doing, we're going to come over here, we're going to have a, a quick session on here's what prayer looks like, right? Um, now, here's the irony of this, right? In verse 7, he says, and when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do. We're going to think more about that in just a second. Isn't it interesting that people take verses 9 and following and make them exactly that? This almost <laughs> prayer in the form of magic words. Right? Like, this, this is the only way you're allowed to pray. This isn't. He says, pray then like this in, in this version. What does that mean? Here's what it looks like. Here's an example, right? It doesn't mean it's the only type of prayer. It's just, here's an example of what that thing looks like. What's so interesting about his prayer is, honestly, that it's so short. It's, <laughs> it's less than a minute. It, it's less than 30 seconds if you just kind of just say it out loud. Prayer didn't have to be something that was long or verbose or, you know, you know pull out all your big words or you have to pray for 10 minutes or you have to pray an X number of times, Right? It's, it's just this connection that, that you make between you and God. And it gives you examples of the types of things you pray about. Praying about God's holiness, right? Notice the prayer starts, emphasize, it starts with emphasis on God. His kingdom, His will being done. His giving of bread, right? His forgiveness of sins. His leading us from evil. Um, your Bible might, at the end of verse 13, include some version of, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. I'm of the mind it's supposed to be there. That's one place I disagree with the ESV. Um, the King James includes it. The New American Standard will include it, I think, in brackets. And the ESV puts it in the footnotes. I think it ought to be there, but you know, I wasn't around when it was written. So I don't get to decide. Obviously, there's not a lot of people in the auditorium that have prayed the rosary. Yes. You've seen them. Yes. You know what they are. Basically, and, and this, it was kind of funny. I was just thinking as you were talking about our father. I can't tell you how many times I've said that. Yeah. As a kid. Well, and in, in Catholicism, they even call it the Our, the all fa the our Father, right? Yeah. I don't remember. Yeah. If, yeah, I mean, that's isn't there a Latin thing. version of that too or uh, something? You know, there always uh, is. But they call the prayer Our Father because that's how it begins. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and Hail Mary and all that uh, that you do on the rosary. But it's interesting. When we used to do confession, which <laughs> probably nobody's done as well. That's what you have. You know, you go in and you say, you know, I beat up my sister. Or I did whatever. You know, and they'd say for your penance, you go say three Our Fathers and fourteen Hail Marys, and right. go and sin no more. And it's just interesting as you look. But it, <laughs> when we look at about vain, empty phrases, the last point I'm trying to make. 
It's Dude. just repetitive. It means nothing. It's not your heart. It, it's just what we had to do as kids. And I yeah. know the adults probably are better than that. But, you know, we did 14 of them, and we're done. We're good. We go yeah. about our business and go play. Why, why didn't 13 work, right? It's like, <laughs> Do not heap up empty phrases, for they think they'll be heard for their many words. I mean, it literally says that. I guess. I guess. Except Naaman was told by God to do that, right? <laughs> no one has told anybody to say seven our fathers after, after prayer. All right. So, again, prayer being one of those subjects that's... It's almost as if, you know, teachers do this from time to time. They say, okay, we're talking about a thing. Oh, we need to come over and kind of spend a minute on, on a parallel subject. And then we have third example, fasting. Don't <laughs> miss the pattern as you work your way through. It's easy to zoom in too close and miss kind of the, the bigger version of what it looks like. This is a good place to notice, too. Jesus doesn't switch topics between the beginning and the end of the chapter. He just switches applications. The topic throughout the chapter is why are you doing what you're doing, right? The first half of the chapter is really centered on doing what you do to be seen by other people, right? To impress them, to, to you know, gain favor with them. The second half of the chapter is more along the lines of doing what you do because you trust in your things. And everything fits within that, within that framework. Okay. Um, I did have a couple questions in addition to the, the ones in the text that I, or the book that I don't like. What does it mean in there in verse, uh, let's see, three. When you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Our biblical hyperliteralists are going to have a heyday with this. <laughs> because it's like, well, so what does it mean? Do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Yeah. The first thing there is when we do what we do for God, it's natural. It's not we're doing it because we're trying to show off, so to speak. Okay, okay. That's a good, that's a good application of that, yeah. You said that I forgot to. It's something mm -hmm. that it says quietly, simply, in your gut. Mm -hmm. All right. Yes, ma'am. Keep your good deeds to yourself. Okay. Anybody else want to kind of tack on to those things? Is Jesus being literal? I don't know how you could physically do that. I mean, maybe stick one hand in your back pocket while you while you hand people money with the other, or or do whatever you're doing, or you know maybe maybe you you know tie it off and let it go numb so it wasn't it doesn't know right. It just unconscious. right. So it's like how. Jesus used expressions the same way you and I use expressions, right? He used expressions. Don't let your left, left hand know what your right is doing means it's as if you're trying to hide it. It's as if you're trying really not even to let your own self know what you're doing. This is the attitude you have when you, as it says there, give to the needy. You're not looking to have it widely known or broadcast. You're not doing it so that other people will go, oh, wow, look at how much he gave or... He must be pious or he must be very generous. It's an expression, right? It's not something meant to be taken literally. Yeah. The other way you can look at this, from the example, you know what it does not mean. Sometimes we don't know completely what something does mean. We know more exactly what it doesn't mean. Because when he's comparing this to what they were doing, you can see clearly what he's trying to go the opposite way of what that is. So, yeah. you know, sometimes you... And he uses an expression kind of on the extreme other side to show here's, here's what I mean. You're supposed to turn away from that and turn away from it in a big way. So here's my next. Oh, yeah. I was just thinking you had a lesson a few weeks ago where. I don't remember it. <laughs> <laughs> well, where we truly love God and it's our desire to please Him mm -hmm. and truly, totally. Please him. So what we're, whatever we're doing, that's that's my motive. My motive isn't to let people see me and then think better of me. However, they're going to do. Yeah. I don't. I don't want to up, up in where you're going. But I'll, I'll, I'll throw this out. You're gonna do it anyway. No, it's interesting. Jesus does not tell them stop doing this because they're not doing it right. 
right, and that's one of the problems of mm -hmm. that There are certain topics, for example, we stay away from them because so many in the denominational world get it wrong and abuse it that we're afraid to wander into that topic because of the implication. Well, we got, we got one of those this morning. Yeah, Jesus right here is an example of it, this is right to do. They're doing it with the wrong motive. Don't, yeah. you know, keep, you do what they do, but don't do it from the same boat. Yeah, same absolutely. Okay, so I think we would agree, verse 3, Jesus is using an expression. He's using an example to try to get the point across of what he's saying. He doesn't mean literally, don't let your left hand know what your right hand's doing. Now go back and reread verse 2. What do you think he's doing in verse 2? When you give to the needy, or thus when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you as the hypocrites do. I doubt this was happening. This seems extreme, right? It seems extreme that they would go into the streets, the Pharisees, and blow trumpets to show, look at how much I'm, you know, let the fanfare, right? You bring a band along because I'm going to give to the all. Oh, seems a little much. And all I'm suggesting is this. If he's willing to use an expression in verse 3, then it's possible verse 2 is as well. Now, what's the point of verse 2? Right? It's an extreme example of the negative. It's as if you went out and blew a trumpet to get everyone's attention to see what you did that was so silly. It's also kind of a, a, a sharp jab at people who make sure other people know what they're doing. See what I'm saying? Those people that... Just make sure that they're in a crowded audience when they give to the poor. They make sure to go out at the highest point in the marketplace. When it's its most crowded, then the Pharisee shows up with the headdress and the phylacteries and the whatever. And they, you know, open the bag and they just lavish on the... See what I'm saying? They probably would have been better served if they had just blown a trumpet <laughs> to show this is what they're doing, Right? So he kind of uses an example from the extreme negative to the extreme positive is, is what I'm getting at there. How do you and I do that? Scripture warns us of things that we're capable of doing and frankly that we do sometimes. How do we draw attention to ourselves when we give? Let's think about how it actually happens. If you had to give an example of how it happens today, how, do, how does it work? What do you think? Mm. You didn't ask us to think. Come on, man. How does it happen? Does it happen? We're free of this. It never happens at all. Yeah. Sometimes all we want to do is talk about ourselves or what we're doing and not ask. Yeah. It just so happens in conversation we bring up the fact that we gave five bucks to the guy on the side of the road when he, when he just happened to need it. Or... You know, every time we go around that day, we tell the story about how we helped the guy change his tire. Or we helped this or we helped that. It just so happens that that's what we, we talked about all that day, right? It's a good example of it. The way we talk to people, our conversations, all right? What else? Any other examples? Yeah. Oh, sorry. One at a time. Yes, you and then you're next. A lot of people like to post things on social media. Oh, social media. There we go. You're exactly right, though. You're exactly right. It just, you know, let the world know. I, I did my, my good deed for the day. Yeah. Maybe just make more of a similar term, but maybe just seeking kind of affirmation of what we're doing. I was in the podcast from time to time about concentrating on what we're doing, not how we're doing. Yeah. What we start to ask how we're doing. This, this wasn't almsgiving, but it was, a, it was an example of doing a good thing and then wanting someone else to give me the attaboy, right? Uh, before we left our house in Clinton, the, uh, you would appreciate this, the bathtub needed reglazing, <laughs> right? And I had done it really poorly the first time, and it went badly. And so I'd done it again the right time, and, man, it looked beautiful. It was so good. I just had to tell my realtor, you need to go in there and look at that bathroom. You have got to go. Who? That's that's silly. Why? Go look at my bathtub. That's a really weird thing to say to somebody. But oh, I've said that. Go look in there at the bathtub. And she looked at me with a straight face. She goes, "You want an attaboy?" And I thought, 
well, yeah. <laughs> I want someone to go see what, how good of a job I did. It, it wasn't giving an alm or, or doing good for someone in need. I guess I was the one in need, but that attitude of I have to have my, my you know, attaboys from the people around me. It even says in the text that they may be praised by others. Now, in verse 2, truly I say to you, they've received their reward. What reward is he talking about? What's the reward? The attaboy. What reward did they lose? That's the point. Right? Because at the end of verse 4, the Father who sees in secret will reward you. If you do things to be seen by others, others are the ones that are going to reward you. If you do things so that God will be pleased, God's the one who rewards you. Right? You get your reward either way. And that pattern works down through the text too. Look at the person who prays, right? The person who prays in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. They get their reward. And what is the reward? Oh, well, they get the people walking by going, man, that, that Pharisee, man, he, boy, he's, he's a godly person. He's out there. He's praying all the day and just, just in the sun and in the rain. They're just, they pray all the time. Or maybe they go to synagogue and they hear the 13-minute prayer by the Pharisee who just, you know, is just going to go on and on and on and on and on. And they think, well, that must, person must, they're getting their reward from the people around them, not from the God who made them, right? There's that contrast. Who rewards you, right? Works its way through the text, too. Okay. Um, we're warned against heaping up empty phrases. How do we do that? How do we heap up empty phrases? We mentioned one already, right? Treating the Lord's Prayer like a magic word formula. Okay, as that's obviously a way we can do that. How else can we do that? Heap up empty phrases as we pray. I love that expression. It's literally like piling them up, right? If our pile's tall enough, then God will notice it and, and maybe do something, right? What I do, I can I catch myself doing it. If you find a phrase or something that you, I like that. I like how that sounds. I like what that, and then you find yourself using it without thinking about it. It just saying it because it fits there in the prayer. It just is my pattern, right? Yeah. Um, it's one of those times, if, if you follow a person around long enough, you notice that they pray the same all the time. Sometimes they do that. I, I'm guilty of that as well, right? Praying without thinking. Praying phrases without actually giving thought to what the phrase says. Prime example. I've said this before. Guide, guard, and direct us till we meet again. <laughs> that is a perfectly good phrase, except isn't guide and direct the same? It, kind of. I mean... They're in the same sort of category. But what happened? We heard that phrase and we liked it and it stuck. And we just, it can be, you know, it can be, we treat it almost as magic words. As long as we say the right pattern, it, it'll be fine. Um, nothing wrong with individual phrases. It's how we use them, whether we're thinking about them. A person can say that and truly, truly desire that God would guide them and they, they would protect them and they even direct them how, if that's even the same thing. But it's the how, right? It's the heart behind that. Yes, sir. Certainly not. Certainly not. Jesus prayed all night on, on at least one occasion. He wasn't out there saying, you know, the Our Father for eight hours straight. He had things to pray about, and he and he spent a long time praying it. Prayers can be short, they can be silent, even within your head, they can be out loud, you know. Where they come from is, is the part that matters, right? They have to come from the heart. All right. Um, verse 7. There's a contrast in verse 7 that I really, really like. It says, When you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think they'll be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. I guess I should have said verse 7 and verse 8. The Gentiles pray... And they pray these long, you know, heaped up prayers so that God will hear them. Jesus gives sort of the, the contrast to that. It's not as if God needs to hear you at all. He knows what you need already. So not just that God already hears you, but God knows what you need before you even begin praying. Right? So then how, how pointless is it to pray, well, not to pray, but to pile up a tall prayer thinking you need God to notice it so he'll, so he'll act, right? God, God knows what a person needs before they ever open their mouth, right? So then prayer has to be something, has to be something different, has to be from the heart. 
All right, um, I asked this question. I'm rapidly running out of time. Um, let's read the rest of it because there's a few points I wanted to make from the, the end of the chapter. Um, I'll pick up the first one, and if someone will pick up verse 22 when I get there, all right, I will just we'll go from there. Um, from the ESV, verse 19. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Okay, down to verse 24. Can I get a reader? Go ahead. For the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light is the darkness, how great is the darkness. No one can serve two masters. He will either hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Okay, uh, picking up verse 25, because we get a therefore, right? Bad, stop, bad time to stop is it a therefore. Who wants to begin at verse 25? Uh, uh, if you'll go to uh, 30, 25 to 30, and then we'll get a volunteer for the rest of the chapter. All right? Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life or what you will eat, what you will drink, or about your body, body or what you will wear. It's not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in farms, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? And why do you worry about clothes? See the lilies of the field, how they grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that, <clears throat> excuse me, if that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you? Okay, 31 to the rest. Sean, or, um, go ahead. Yes. Therefore do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things, sufficient for the day all right, excellent. Um, let's notice a pattern, All right, This is something that's neat. For one, the pattern has broken from the beginning of the chapter, right? There was the, you know, beware of practicing before men, and then we hear nothing more about hypocrites. You didn't hear about hypocrites at all in that reading. It's because the subject has changed. Now we're talking about kind of stuff and our relationship to that stuff. In what do we trust sort of permeates these three, sec these, I say three, four sections of the text. Um, what's interesting, the lamp of the body section, verses 22 and 23, when we read that by itself, it's like, why does he start talking about a lamp and a light and the body is healthy and then we're full of darkness? It's like, what on earth is he talking about? It's clarified when we read it with what's above and what's below. The texts above and below both deal with stuff, don't they? In, in different ways. The first text section from, you know, 19 down to 18, or sorry, yeah, 19 to 21 is about treasure. 24 is about serving. You're going to serve your money, your, your mammon, your treasure, your money, or your God. The one in the middle fits in there too. It's about what you're looking at, what you follow. If what you look at is darkness, what you're going to be is darkness. If you follow it, that's what's going to happen. If you follow light, you're going to be light, right? What you go after matters. There's another pattern. Notice verse 25. Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? That verse is similar to verse 1. Remember where Sean pointed it out, it's like, Beware practicing your righteousness. And then we get some examples. Verse 25 does the same thing. The question actually sets up what comes next. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? What's the next two things Jesus talks about? He talks about the birds of the air and how God feeds them. Right? What's the next example? He talks about the lilies of the field and how God 
clothes them. So the, so the food and the clothing really tell us about the next two things that are going to come after that. He gives two examples, one from food, one from clothing. So it, it, it makes sense. He's not just pulling these out of the air. He said God's in control of both of those things. And he gives you an example of the birds and the, the lilies of the field. And then in 31, therefore, don't be anxious. So those are your examples. Question. Um, the question Jesus asked, is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? What's the answer? Yes. Absolutely. Right? That's, is, oh, by the way, rhetorical questions are always answered opposite of the way they're stated, right? When he says, is not, that's a negative question. So the answer is positive. It's, it's yes. And that's exactly the point. Life is more than clothing. Or sorry, life is more than food. The, the fact that you're given a body is more than your clothing. And then he contrasts the way he cares for something that's relatively worthless with how he cares for something that's much more worth, well, it has much more value, you as a person. If God's willing to feed the birds, which are you know, not exactly worthless, but close to it in the grand scheme of things, if he cares for them, he'll care for you. If he clothes the grass of the field in a way that's even more spectacular than Solomon himself was clothed, he'll, he'll, he'll take care of you too, right? It's value statements in both of those. Did I hear a... He, he later illustrates the, the price of the birds, how little value they would really have. Yeah. And, and we're concerned whether God will care for us. And we fail to look around and see, well, he takes care of everything that... You know, even according to his creation is worth less than you are. I'm not saying birds are worthless, but humankind was created to be in dominion over those things, right? To rule over the earth, not the animal. And if that's the case, he's definitely going to take care of you. I like verse 12. I like and I hate verse 27 too, because I like to be anxious. I mean, it's, it's not fun, but it's, it gets, you know, it's, it keeps me busy. Which of you by being anxious can add a single hour to a span of life? What's the answer? None of you, right? Even if we didn't consider the question, it's rhetorical. Which of you can is positive. So the answer is no. You can't do it. You can't, you know, add a single hour to your life by being anxious. If so, we'd live forever. Right? Some of us longer than others, right? I'm not going anywhere if, if anxiety adds time to your life. Uh, but it doesn't, right? Um, that's similar to a teaching he has elsewhere. You know, which of you can change one of your hairs from white to black? Remember he said that about swearing of oaths earlier in the text? There's a limit to human will. And human will cannot uh, extend itself, right, in terms of that. All right? Therefore, don't be anxious, saying, what do we eat, what do we drink, what do we wear? Towards the end of the last section, Jesus switched from contrasting the Pharisees to the Gentiles. He does the same thing here. He doesn't say Pharisees out loud, but these would have been wealthier individuals, right? people that are a little more well-to-do than the rest of them. He talks about people laying up treasure on earth and serving two masters. And then he transitions to those Gentiles. The Gentiles seek after all those things, and your Father knows that you need them. Earlier, Jesus said, the Gentiles heap up prayers because they think they'll be heard, and God knows what you need before you ask Him. Here, the Gentiles seek after all those things, and God knows you need them already. Right? It's a another version of the same kind of argument. But in verse 33, we have the thing we are supposed to seek after. Seek first the kingdom. Right. Does this mean we don't have jobs? No. There's a priority to things. There's a concern and what we should actually be concerned about first and foremost is the kingdom. God's going to add to you by his providence all these other things. Yeah. Just one more example, I guess, as you said, we're a Mm-hmm. It's another version of the same thing, right? So if the heart's set on pleasing other people, you might say the first half of the chapter, now this heart is set on, well, I'm going to put my trust in my things and depend on them and be anxious over them, right? And in both cases, God's the answer. If we're, if we're concerned about what people think of us, we need to be really more concerned about what God thinks of us and do things for that reason. If we're concerned about providing for all of ourselves and being anxious over those things, we've got to understand God's the one who gives all of that. And again, seek His 
will over our own, we'll be taken care of. Right? It's a hard thing to do. It's an act of faith to do that. Um, and that's sort of how I set up the rest of the chapter. It's about what you're serving and why. Yeah. Before you go, the, the very last sentence I should have got to before you changed slides. I'm sorry. Okay. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Yeah. Carry your take on that, please. You've got enough to worry about. <laughs> I mean, I, it's like you're going to be anxious about tomorrow. It's not even here yet, right? You can do nothing right now that directly affects your tomorrow. Whether you have it or not is an act of God. Today's got plenty, I, th I, think, is, I think is the idea. It's an important statement for us. Today, you've got plenty enough to do, right? Uh, I have one, two, three. All right, uh, you go first. Fine, and you go next. Uh, you hear about radio programs where they recite the Lord's Prayer. Mm -hmm. Well, they, they pray for the kingdom to come that's already here. Yeah, there is a... <laughs> In context, this is before the kingdom. That part of it seems useless to me, but uh, Jesus was teaching his disciples what to pray for, you know, at that present time that mm -hmm. the kingdom wasn't about to come. So if you amended it to his, you know, your kingdom has come, that would be perfectly acceptable, right? And it's similar to the way Jesus talked about the kingdom, right? The kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's, it's almost here, right? Uh, Sean, or I'm sorry, did you have one? Oh, I love that. I, I'm good at that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, this isn't a this isn't a call to abandon making wise decisions that will be beneficial later. That's certainly something we need to be doing, right? Make a decision now that will have a good consequence. But it's the sitting around worrying about, you know, what's, you know, what's going to happen down the road is the problem. Sean, you had one? Oh, yeah. There's, there's a real sense of the thing you can positively affect is your relationship with God and your you know, promotion of His kingdom and going after His things. Right? The rest of it, in a sense, you're going to be provided one way or the other. Whether you seek God or not, He makes the rain fall later on in the on the just and the unjust. But He doesn't force the just or the unjust to obey Him and turn to Him. That's the thing we can have an effect on. We can make, it, make headway there. Quick point, it's interesting to me that do not let the sun go down on your wrath. Don't, if you will, don't think about tomorrow. And both of them, Jesus is saying, deal with today. Yeah. You know, whatever you have today, deal with it today. Don't yep. wait. And, you know, sometimes anxiety is that I don't deal with it and I just keep worrying about it over and over and over again. Yeah. Because whatever the matter is, do today what I can about that. Seek God first. And, and in effect, I have to say, what I cannot resolve, let ask God to resolve. Yeah. You heard of, you heard of paralysis by analysis? All right. You got plenty to do. Worry about today. All right. Um, we had a few of that. Let's talk next week, Lord willing, about chapter seven. All right. That'll be November 3rd, if you can believe it. Um, we'll just focus our attention on chapter seven, and then we'll try to pick back up with the book schedule of things. All right.